Okay, thanks. Um, again, my name is Steve Fortney. I work for Terraqua Consulting. Uh, I, we're based out of North Central Washington. So it's my pleasure to come down here and speak to you about uh, the Columbia Habitat Monitoring Program. Um, and uh, really it's the, um, uh, a result of uh, a lot of people's hard work and effort to develop this protocol that um, started, uh, we started it uh, full force in 2011, but it um, leverages and takes advantage of a lot of the protocols and work that's gone on before um, the development of this protocol. So I just wanted to um, thank the collaborators who've been working on this project uh, from uh, QCI and Watershed Solutions and Ecological Research, NOAA, Utah State University, and South Fork Research. Um, and uh, Bonneville Power Administration has uh, funded this project. Um, the CHAMP protocol um, grew out of ISUMP, which is the Integrated Status and Effectiveness Monitoring Program, which is also a NOAA and Bonneville Power Administration um, collaborative project. And uh, ISEM started back in 2004. And there's a whole slew of other um, collaborators that have worked on this project, including um, uh, some tribal entities, um, state agencies, and other consulting firms. Um, and so really today, I'm just gonna give you a brief overview of uh, uh, CHAMP. Um, specifically the protocol and what the objectives of CHAMP are. Um, so um, CHAMP is, uh, uh, the objective of CHAMP is to monitor the status and trend of salmon and steelhead populations across the Columbia River Basin. Um, and in the Federal Columbia River Power System um, 2008 BIOP, there, are, were, there were some prescriptions for habitat monitoring and requirements for um, developing procedures for adaptively managing uh, the, the places where these listed uh, fish populations resided. Um, again, it was a result of collaboration among BPA and NOAA, and um, there were a couple of specific questions that were tasked to CHAMP um, to help answer, and that includes identifying you know, the threats or the limiting factors that prevents um, uh, fish populations and um, individual growth and survival, and also understanding the relationships between um, habitat and fish, and then also understanding how habitat improvement projects can um, be effective at um, recovering endangered fish populations. <clears throat> uh, let's see, so the um, main geographic area in which uh, CHAMP is being implemented is the um, interior Columbia Basin. It's three orders magnitude bigger than Battle Creek, like 200 and some thousand square miles. Um, and there are a couple of priority watersheds where CHAMP is being um, implemented. Some of those watersheds are intensively monitored watershed experiments where um, there are a, a slew of habitat improvement projects that are scheduled um, in order to understand what the effects of those improvement projects are on fish populations. And those are identified in this map as um, yellow polygons. So some of those would include the Eniat watershed, um, which is up in north central Washington, uh, the John Day watershed in northeast Oregon, the Lemhi watershed over in eastern Idaho. Um, some of the other watersheds where CHAMP is being implemented are the uh, Medhow watershed, Wenatchee watershed, uh, Upper Grand Ron, South Fork Salmon, and then folks down on the north coast are also using CHAMP as a way to describe the current status of fish habitat conditions as well as um, how those conditions are changing over time. And, um, folks from Campbell Timber Company and California Department of Fish and Wildlife are um, currently um, using CHAMP down in the Big River and Navarro River watersheds. And um, like Steve mentioned, we're proposing to um, implement CHAMP in the Battle Creek watershed to um, make a connection between the stream conditions and um, fish populations of concern in that watershed. 
uh, it, the design that's used to uh, select sites in these watersheds is a probabilistic design, and it's a split panel design where we have um, annual uh, panel uh, sites that are sampled every year, and a couple of or three rotating panels where sites are sampled every three years. Um, we've used uh, the generalized random tessellation stratified statistical package to um, select sites across a watershed. And um, the benefit of using GRITS is um, that you can select sites that are spatially balanced across the domain of interest. Um, they can be stratified based on whatever criteria you determine is important for understanding the diversity of fish habitat, uh, such as um, a geomorphic reach class, um, and you can incorporate legacy sites. And then, of course, these sites are weighted um, and um, used in statistical models to roll up across the whole domain of interest. Um, so this matrix here kind of displays or illustrates um, a typical nine-year study plan for um, some of the watersheds that we're implementing CHAMP in the Columbia Basin, um, where uh, sites in rotating panel one are visited three times out of those nine years, and uh, sites in the annual panel, of course, are visited every year. Uh, th uh, this, these two maps uh, are of watersheds up in north central Washington, Wenatchee, and any at watersheds. Um, in the Wenatchee watershed, we have strictly a status and trend um, study design. So we've distributed our sites across the, both the Steelhead and Chinook anadromous extent. We have about 53 sites in um, those four panels. Um, we added a couple sites because we actually trimmed down the frame a little bit based on some recent knowledge about fish barriers and the anadromous extent. Um, on the other hand, uh, in the Eniat watershed, we're using CHAMP to evaluate um, fish habitat conditions um, both in the present and um, tracking those conditions over time. But then we're also using it to gauge um, habitat responses to improvement projects. And so you can see we've got quite a few more sites in this watershed and they're um, in uh, concentrated in the main stem Entiat River in the lower 26 miles here, and we have about uh, 78 sites, uh, 300 meters long in, the, in that lower 26 miles, and then we, the rest of the sites are scattered around, spatially balanced across the steelhead domain. Um, and we're in the Entiat watershed, um, which is an intensively monitored watershed, there's uh, phased restoration or rehabilitation projects that um, occur every three years during this um, nine-year experiment. And so our, our monitoring is, hope is, the goal of the monitoring is to track changes um, at the watershed scale and at the reach scale um, to those projects. Um, so it's important um, when establishing your study design to understand the geomorphic context. And we've done that by looking at the watershed as a nested hierarchical organized um, stream network. And so we, when we assess the geomorphology of the stream network, we look at the regional setting, so climate and geology, and we look at how those controls act at the watershed scale. And then we also look at bottom-up controls, like the assemblages of geomorphic units, the bed material texture, and, um, and then we come up with um, a distribution of geomorphic reach types across that watershed. And we, <coughs> excuse me, we use that as a way to stratify our sampling. And we also use um, this information as a way to roll up our uh, fish habitat data. Um, and so we, um, the power of uh, the CHAMP protocol is its ability to, um, to evaluate fish habitat at a mul multiple different scales. So we can um, look at uh, fish habitat at the micro habitat scale, such as um, looking at habitat suitability index scores and understanding um, where along a 120 to 600 meter site is um, 
going to be suitable for either um, spawning salmon or for juvenile rearing. And we can then roll that up to the reach scale if we want. We can um, summarize traditional habitat metrics like pool frequency, residual pool depth at the reach scale. And, um, and then if managers want to understand um, what the habitat condition is across, like say an NRCS HUC5 assessment unit, we can, um, because we've uh, evaluated geomorphic condition across the network scale, we can say something about what the habitat condition is um, at that scale. And, and, and then we can also say something about the fish population at the watershed scale as well. Um, so it's a very powerful tool. We not only use site-based data, but we also use network scale data as well. We use available GIS layers, and um, we do a lot of um, multi-scalar analyses. And then, of course, the overarching goal is to say something about fish habitat uh, status and trend um, within the whole interior Columbia Basin. So you could see from the couple slides ago that we only actually implement CHAMP in a handful of watersheds, but the goal is to say something about fish habitat across everywhere those fish populations reside. And so we have to actually make predictions about fish habitat conditions in unmeasured places. And we have, are exploring tools and ways to do that. Um, some of those tools include um, some spatial autocorrelation models as well as, well as some empirical modeling. <clears throat> um, so getting down into the uh, nitty gritty about protocol development, um, like I said before, we, we've leveraged um, uh, previous protocols when developing CHAMP. Um, some of those protocols include uh, the Aquatic Riparian Effectiveness Monitoring Protocol um, that the, um, believe was um, part of the Northwest Forest Plan, um, ODF, uh, Oregon Department of Fish and Wildlife's Aquatic Inventory Protocol, uh, PIBO, which is the U.S. Forest Service, um, Fish Habitat Monitoring Protocol, uh, EMAP, an EPA protocol, um, R1, R4, and um, the, aqua the um, effect Action Effectiveness Monitoring Protocol, which is a companion project um, within Bonneville Power Administration. All of these protocols have been used to develop CHAMP, and, um, and the reason for for building on these other protocols is so that we can crosswalk with these other protocols. And we've done that specifically with, with PIBO. We did a comparison study back in 2012 where um, PIBO crews and CHAMP crews uh, went to six sites, and I think it was three crews from each organization. And we were able to show that those two protocols are um, uh, easy to, to crosswalk. Um, and a few of the metrics, may, I think we had to do some linear transformations, but. Um, it's uh, pretty straightforward, and I'll get into why why it's um, a, an easy thing to do with Champ. And one of the one of the reasons is because of um, one of the biggest components of Champ is the topographic survey. So we um, send a crew of three out to a site, and again, a site can be anywhere from 120 meters to 600 meters long in a typical status and trend sampling design watershed, and um, uh, two of the folks on the crew conduct the topographic survey. So if you're not familiar um, with, with what that is, it's, it's a way to map out the, the dimensions of the channel and adjacent floodplain in three, in three dimensions um, by collecting X, Y, Z coordinates and using that to then um, generate a, a two and a half dimensional map. And, um, the reason why we use total stations, it's a, it's a little bit slower technology, but it's a, a common denominator. It works in all situations. It doesn't require um, a communication with satellites like an RTK GPS. And, um, and so, you know, people have questioned, you know, is this possible to implement across uh, such a large program? We proved it is possible. We have a intensive training at the beginning of every, every summer, and we teach people about the um, traditional um, techniques of surveying using total stations. And um, the crews go out and collect anywhere from 600 to 2,000 points at a site. 
Um, the crews actually process that data in GIS at the end of their hitch, um, convert that into a, a triangular irregular, triangulated irregular network or TIN, which is a way to interpolate those XYZ points into a surface. And then from that, a DEM or digital elevation model, a two and a half dimension map of that stream reach is created. And from that, we can um, generate dozens and dozens of metrics that are compatible with other programs and say a lot about what the current status is. And then we use tools to actually um, say um, how that um, fish habitat's changing over time and um, how that fish habitat's connected to um, fish um, survival and growth and other demographic rates. And so one of the critical components of processing that data is um, leveraging the river bathymetry toolkit. This is a software package that has been developed by um, people who are funded by um, BPA and NOAA and working on this project. Um, uh, as a consulting firm up in Canada and then um, some folks out of uh, Utah State University. And this is a pretty slick package to be able to um, generate uh, traditional uh, fish habitat um, or stream characteristic metrics like wetted volume or bankful width or residual pool depth. And the way it works is um, we basically um, some of the points that the crews collect are water surface elevation points and bankful elevation points. And you can see um, on the left that uh, graph shows what the raw DEM, the points on a raw DEM would look like and the elevations would actually decline um, downstream. And, but um, in order to, a uh, critical piece for, um, for operating the river bathymetry toolkit is to detrend those points so that they are actually on a relatively um, consistent elevation. And then once we do that, we can um, uh, generate a bunch of other metrics. We also generate a thalwag uh, line in GIS. We generate um, a wetted center line. And um, a li limitless number of cross sections can be generated. And this is one of the ways that this data can be, can be crosswalked with other, with other protocols. Um, and the, crew, the crews who collect this data actually edit some of these cross sections to make sure that they're lining up correctly, um, you know, in the office. Um, this is how the slick um, RBT stage slider works. Uh, crews find the best fit for the water extent and bankful um, polygons by interactively varying the water stage depth in the detrended DEM. And, um, any stage can be modeled, not just the um, water elevation at the time of the survey, but a flood stage because we've mapped the um, whole channel and, and floodplain in three dimensions. <coughs> Essentially, it's a poor man's hydraulic model. <coughs> Excuse me. Um, so that's a little insight into how that um, topographic data is processed in the office. Um, one of the other powerful tools we use to actually track changes in fish habitat over time are, uh, is a tool called uh, Geomorphic Change Detection. It's developed by uh, Joe Whedon out of Utah State University in collaboration with some other folks. Um, and we use this tool to um, spatially explicit, um, explicitly quantify changes in the channel morphology. So we can use this to um, document and map out exactly where um, bank erosion is occurring, where bar development is occurring, uh, where floodplain aggradation is, is occurring, where incision is occurring, and we can roll that up and quantify that at each site. <coughs> Excuse me. Um, and the way that's done is uh, just a basic, simple mathematical um, problem of subtraction. So you basically subtract the elevations in um, the old DEM that you create from your initial survey from the new DEM um, that you create from, from the current survey, and you get uh, a DEM of difference. Um, one of the powerful components of this tool is to be able to assess uncertainty um, that's spatially variable. So, <coughs> I should have got a cup of water. Um, and so, um, before this tool was developed, um, you could do some raster calculator math in GIS and, and, and apply a spatially uniform threshold 
to your um, DEM a difference, but um, folks found out that that was, um, it wasn't effective at differentiating noise from signal. So um, Joe Wheaton and others have come up with a way to uh, create um, spatially variable error models to differentiate, thanks a lot for this, guys. Um, to um, tease apart what, what true change is occurring from, from background noise. Um, and this is an example of uh, the results from uh, running a GCD analysis at a site. The blue is the um, quantity of deposition or amount of sediment that's being deposited at a site, and the red is the amount of erosion or the amount of sediment that's being eroded um, at a particular site. And um, this is an ele <coughs> elevation change distribution graph. The gray is the untresholded data. And so you can see if you didn't apply the spatially variable um, uncertainty or error model that you would overestimate the amount of change that was actually happening at that site. So um, just another powerful tool that can be used to, um, to summarize uh, uh, topographic data that's collected uh, in CHAMP. And um, another tool that we've um, worked hard at developing is um, running a, a 2D hydraulic model. And so we've gotten to the point where we can automate the um, uh, generation of, we can automate this model at every site. And we, I think in total in the last four years, we've um, visited over 400 sites and accumulated over 1,000 visits. So we've, we've run this 2D hydraulic model at every single site. It's available on CHAMP, the, the outputs are available on champmonitoring.org, publicly available. And um, the value of this to fish is to show the, the patterns in a spatially explicit way of velocity and depths at a site. And you can see that shear zones get teased out in, in this type of map. And those shear zones are um, extremely profitable areas for juvenile fish to hang out. So they can um, reduce the amount of energy that they expend um, while staying close to um, strong currents where they can duck out and, and eat some food. <coughs> um, this, the outputs from the hydraulic model are important for um, driving some other models. Um, but first I want to talk about the um, habitat suitability model that's been developed within CHAMP and ISAMP. Um, nothing new here except for that it is um, leverages uh, the spatially explicit DEM data, so, um, and the hydraulic model output, so depth and velocity, and then a substrate raster. And then we apply um, habitat suitability curves to each of these rasters, and, um, and then get a habitat suit suitability score um, at a 10 centimeter resolution at each pixel. And then we can summarize that to get um, a habitat suitability index at a site. And this is just uh, some examples of uh, curves that we've used for, um, uh, for summarizing habitat suitability for Chinook spawners. We can uh, model habitat suitability for any life stage um, and for any species that curves are available. And right now we're working on um, developing um, uh, localized curves in the places where we work for both uh, juvenile um, summer rearing as well as, as well as winter rearing. Um, and, and so this is just an illustration of um, a habitat suitability score um, um, at that 10 centimeter resolution. And so you can see um, the places, the, mic the, the micro habitat places that are suitable for, uh, in this case, juvenile rearing. This is then summed up um, uh, at a site by um, multiplying the area times the habitat suitability index to get a weighted usable area. And then this can then be used to actually um, estimate carrying capacity. <clears throat> um, we also use the hydraulic model to drive um, some bioenergetics modeling where we um, leverage uh, the substrate sizes that are measured at a CHAMP site to develop um, a bed roughness raster. And we, um, use uh, 
and then we can then make predictions about the net rate of energy intake um, in a spatially explicit way and then make predictions about carrying capacity. And um, the reason why I keep showing carry, carrying capacity as an output is because recently we've been doing a lot of work with life cycle modeling, and, which is a way to um, understand what the bottlenecks are um, over the life history of a salmon po population. That information is critical to managers for understanding how to um, uh, recover fish populations, which um, habitat actions to implement and where to implement those actions. Um, so real quickly, a little bit about data management. Um, crews collected data in an iPad. Um, there's a, a, a thorough set of validation rules that um, are um, implemented in, the, in not only the iPad, but also in the um, a data broker software in the laptop computer back in the office and then as well up on, on champmonitoring.org. And so eventually the data is um, uploaded to champmonitoring.org where, uh, where I said uh, before it's uh, publicly available. Um, and uh, crews collect temperature data, riparian structure, uh, bed material, drift, um, solar radiation, uh, discharge, um, we install uh, onset uh, tidbits to um, measure um, stream temperature hourly. And so that's um, all of the auxiliary data that gets uploaded. And then the crews spend um, a couple of hours processing the topographic data in um, ArcGIS and um, leveraging the, the river bathymetry toolkit. And then all of that data, once it passes the validation rules, gets uploaded to champmonitoring.org as well. Um, and so uh, some of this data is publicly available. Some of it's um, still in development, so it's just run on a desktop version of the software. So the habitat suitability models and geomorphic unit tool are, right now are just uh, desktop only. Um, the geomorphic change detection software is run on all the sites, and the outputs from that tool are um, available on champmonitoring.org, as well as dozens of RBT generated metrics and 2D hydraulic model outputs. Um, we also spend some time every year um, evaluating our, uh, our metrics and we, the one way we do that is through uh, variance decomposition. So it basically just um, looks at the relative magnitude of different variance components in relation to others. And I think we look at year to year effect and watershed effect and, and a couple other variants um, uh, statistics. Uh, we've also, like I said, um, done some specific fo focus studies like the um, champ Pibo comparison study. Every year we um, conduct a 10% repeat sampling study where we look at um, metric variability and um, variability within season. And, um, and then some of the outcomes of these um, metric evaluations are just understanding um, how to refine which metrics we produce and the quality of our metrics. Um, and then <clears throat> this is really where the rubber meets the road and um, how to upscale some of the site-based data across the watershed. And right now we use GRITS as a way to, to um, make predictions at the watershed and sub-watershed scale. The green boxes show um, the statistical tools that we use to upscale. Um, we also use empirical models, like I said before, so that's basically just leveraging landscape attributes like temperature or gradient or um, contributing drainage area or flow, and then um, uh, running that through a regression model with a, a particular chant metrics. And we can use that to then make um, spatially uh, explicit predictions across a watershed. <coughs> um, and um, I'd like to emphasize really the importance of understanding the geomorphic context because if you don't get that right, then your upscaling efforts are going to fall short. And so we've done, we're starting to, um, we've embarked on evaluating geomorphic context in each CHAMP watershed. So this is an example of uh, mapping out geomorphic reach types in the Wenatchee watershed. We've determined that there are actually 16 distinct geomorphic reach types eight of which are in the confined valley setting, uh, five of which are in partly confined valley setting, and, um, and we can use that to validate some of our upscaling efforts. We can also use some network tools that we've developed to um, get at these geomorphic reach types as landscape variable, variables, such as valley confinement. So 
We've actually mapped valley confinement across the whole network in these prioritized champ watersheds. We've mapped out um, channel confinement, bankful channel, polygons, and, um, and then summarized the stream network by plan form and sinuosity. And all this is important because um, management agencies need to know uh, the places where you can actually um, benefit from putting in projects. So if, if you're putting in a project that is, fit, is you know, against what the physics say should happen, then the, that project is destined to fail. So um, again, more information about stream temperature modeling. And then one last thing, um, this data is super helpful and useful for management agencies in um, designing habitat projects. And so you can um, use the tools that I've described to actually understand how these design elements are gonna change channel morphology. Uh, so we use that, uh, do this with GCD, HSI, and, and REI. So I wanted to thank um, this whole dozens of contributors that have um, worked hard to develop CHAMP up in uh, Washington, Oregon, and, and down on the North Coast here in California. Um, with that, I'd like to say thanks and entertain any questions. <laughs> any questions? Did any of your uh, CHAMP uh, watersheds burn this year? Yeah, up in north central Washington, <clears throat> um, the fire season's been pretty intense um, the last couple summers, and it's a lot of the shrub stuff that, that just burns really fast and furious. Um, and but then we've got some kind of more slow burning um, fires in the in the conifer, wetter wetter regions too. Um, and so um, that that. Uh, that causes some challenges in actually getting on the ground and, and sampling, but it also is kind of interesting for people, so for some of our analysts to um, kind of track, you know, what the effects of those wildfires are on habitat conditions. 